Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll discuss the possible impact of the Trump presidency on health care policy. Also tonight, we'll hear about the American Indian Awards of Excellence. And former Housing Secretary Henry Cisneros talks about immigration issues. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Arizona Department of Economic Security Director Tim Jeffries allegedly purchased alcohol for DES staffers during work hours. That's according to DES Assistant Director Leah Landrum Taylor, who says that Jeffries bought employees alcohol, food, and soft drinks for a workday office party. The party was to celebrate the employees agreeing to bonuses in exchange for changing their employment status so that they could be fired at will. Jeffrey says the drinking occurred during off hours and not on state time. And Arizona's jobless rate is down thanks in part to a positive showing across most sectors of the state's economy. The unemployment rate fell to 5.2 percent in October, down from 5.5 percent the previous month. State Department of Administration also reports that Arizona gained 28,000 non-farm jobs in October. That's a couple thousand jobs above the post-recession average gain. Ten of 11 economic sectors added jobs, led by professional and business services, no sectors lost jobs. President-elect Donald Trump has vowed to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. He is also proposing changes to Medicaid, known as Access, in Arizona. Here to talk about possible changes ahead in health care policy is Swapna Reddy, clinical assistant professor at ASU School for Science of Healthcare Delivery. Good to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, just in general, 30,000-foot view, what is the future of the Affordable Care Act under a Trump presidency? Sure. Well, we're not 100% sure is the, short, is the quick answer. Uh, pres uh, President-elect Trump has vowed to repeal and replace the ACA. That was a major campaign promise throughout his campaign. What we know, though, is actually that's not quite as simple as it sounds. And I think that he's starting to find that as he's realizing that campaign promises are a little bit easier than the business of governing. Um, we know that recently he had a meeting with President Obama, and on 60 Minutes we've recently heard that he's interested in possibly keeping certain provisions of the ACA. So the, the quick answer is we're not 100 percent sure. So all we kind of know is what is possible versus what's actually going to happen. Is there is there a likely scenario as to what would be repealed and what would be replaced? Well, he's indicated that he is a fan of two really popular provisions. Uh, one is for young people to be able to stay on their parents' coverage until they're 26 years old. And another is to um, not discriminate based on pre-existing conditions. What makes it a little bit tough is those are um, two of many provisions under the ACA. The ACA, Affordable Care Act, is a huge piece of um, umbrella legislation, and it kind of has tentacles in all kinds of different policies. So it's not really just a single piece of legislation that you can repeal uh, because it's involved in so many other things. And one thing that we know is we don't have a supermajority. The Republicans don't have a supermajority um, in Congress, and so it's unlikely that they'd be able to just have a flat repeal of the ACA. What's a little bit more likely is that they might be able to get in kind of through the back door through a budgetary reconciliation process. Yes, I was going to say. Yeah, and that's what um, they, we have a blueprint for that from last year. The House and the Senate um, were able to pass a budget reconciliation bill that would have largely... Um, overturned the ACA, but of course President Obama vetoed it, mm -hmm. and um, if they use that same blueprint in the next year, it would probably not be vetoed by a President Trump. I, I know uh, Trump said during his campaign he wants to overhaul the Affordable Care Act based on free market principles. Mm -hmm. uh, what might those be? Interesting. We're not 100 percent sure, but free market principles would basically say that um, private companies like insurers and could come in and um, and base prices based on, on how much they could get for, for products. That might be really dangerous for the um, 400,000 people in Arizona that are covered under Medicaid expansion um, and the 22 million people in the United States that are covered under the ACA. But does the ACA, though, survive in any way, shape, or form if the individual mandate is gone. This idea where if you, you, you gotta you gotta participate or else you're gonna get penalized. I know he does not like that at all. You get rid of that, is there an ACA? 
I think it's tough to maintain the ACA as we think of it now. Um, the individual mandate is a really important part of the ACA. It requires everybody to have health in insurance coverage. It's not a particularly popular provision of the ACA. That being said, if not everybody has insurance and not everybody is paying the premiums involved with insurance, it's hard for the dollars to make sense. Um, it's not so easy. We can't really cherry pick which provisions we like and we don't like for the ACA. There's kind of a carrot and stick sort of principle with the Affordable Care Act. And again, regarding these these free market principles, uh, insurance sold across state lines, he wants to see that. He wants to see high risk insurance pools. What are those? So um, his concept is to have high risk insurance pools for people with pre-existing conditions or high utilizers of health care and give more power back to the state specifically around Medicaid um, programs. But these high risk insurance pools, I mean, uh, uh, can they function? Are they viable? Well, there's not a whole lot of detail, frankly, about the high-risk uh, insurance pool. Based on experts that look at the Affordable Care Act and how the dollars and cents would actually work out, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't look too promising at the moment, especially with the current system that we have in place. He, he also wants health savings accounts, and he wants to, I think those are relatively self-explanatory, but the idea of Medicaid block grant funding to states, which gets us to Medicaid, which gets us to access. Yes. Um, these, this, this block grant funding sounds like whatever it is, it means less money to Arizona. It would likely result in less Medicaid dollars to Arizona. Um, basically, we have 400,000 people, like I mentioned, in Arizona that have received Medicaid or that are eligible for Medicaid that were not pre-Affordable Care Act. And so the funding that the federal funding that currently is in place for each state would be reduced and um, each state would actually have a block amount of money to be able to have more power on how they run their own Medicaid programs. So it makes sense for some states and places like Arizona where we have a high need population, we'd probably be seeing less money for that it's, fairly vulnerable population. So seeing less money, fairly vulnerable population, what happens to these people? Well, we're not sure. What we don't want to happen is that they fall off the rolls and they go back into the kind of depths of uninsurance. Because what we know is, from an ethical and moral standpoint, that's not a great place to be. And from a financial standpoint, it's not a great place to be because if they're not having access to preventive care, if they're not having access to regular insurance, they're really going back to the emergency room for basic care. And that ends up being more expensive for everybody, and especially all of the taxpayers in Arizona. Indeed. Um the 2017 coverage, with, and I, everything's uncertain right now. It's all very a big fog out there, but 2017 is right around the corner. Will things change dramatically for 2017 coverage? The experts say no. It doesn't really. It, it doesn't really make sense to say that a whole lot will happen with the ACA um, because actually it can't happen that quickly. One thing that we know is we're in the enrollment period right now, and a million people in the United States have enrolled for 2017 for ACA coverage uh, through the marketplace, and actually just 300,000 enrolled the day after the election, which indicates there's a real need for coverage. Um, in terms of if the reconciliation bill or any kind of repeal efforts would be taken taking place in Congress, it likely would not finish or take place um, or go through until at least 2018, if not 2019. It's just simply, it's not that simple. Yes, and I saw some numbers, uh, the uninsured, uh, I think it was in America, 16% when the law was enacted, 9% now. If, the, if one of the goal, major goals was to get people insured, it seems to be working. Absolutely, absolutely. And in Arizona itself, we went from 17% to 10%. So there's huge drops nationally, there's huge drops in Arizona. If that was one of the goals, we've been successful, and we certainly don't want to go backwards. Is it possible, this is total political speak here, but is it possible he keeps most aspects of the Affordable Care Act and the Republicans keep most aspects, they just call it something else? That's entirely possible, and that might be where, <laughs> that might be where we fall. Um, if we're already looking at uh, popular provi popular provisions of the AC and keeping popular provisions, we might be at a good negotiating point at this point. Yeah, so last question. Uh, will the Affordable Care Act survive as we know it? Unlikely to survive as we know it. Um, Again, there are certain provisions that are highly unpopular, and there's been a lot of campaign promises made about repealing the ACA. So I think we'll certainly see some changes. In terms of replacing the ACA is a whole nother discussion, and we don't have a whole lot of details on what that will look like. But uh, the ACA as we know it, I think will be a little bit different, and at least two years or so, doesn't mean it will be totally different because we do have to find solutions that work for the 22 million people that are insured um, and all the folks that rely on it for regular health care. Indeed. All right. Sopna, good to see you again. Thanks, Thanks for, for joining us. Thanks for having me.
get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. The Phoenix Indian Center hosts an annual dinner to honor outstanding leadership and commitment to the advancement of the American Indian community and for providing significant contributions to the local American Indian economy. Here now to talk about the awards, we welcome Patty Hibbler, and she is the Chief Executive Officer of Phoenix Indian Center, and Jacob Moore, who was honored as the Outstanding Man of the Year in 2016. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Patty, we'll start with you. The American Indian Excellence in Leadership Awards. Explain. Well, last night we actually celebrated our 34th annual awards process. Uh, it began, as I said, 34 years ago and really as a way to celebrate American Indian leadership which began in Phoenix and Greater Maricopa County, and now it's a, a statewide award. And this is something, again, started here in town. What, just a bunch of folks getting together and saying, there's some folks out there we need to recognize. Exactly. That's exactly what happened. So there were kind of unsung heroes or leadership in the community, uh, a group of community members really spearheaded by Phyllis Big Pond, who was previous executive director of the Phoenix Indian Center, came together and said, we need to find a way to recognize these people. And actually, the first year it began as a potluck. Well, there you go. And it's, it's more than a potluck now, isn't it? Yes, it is. So that's really community as a potluck. And we have a, a bunch of names here as far as those who are honored. But the Man of the Year Award went to Jacob Moore. And we know Jacob because he's been on the program here before. Yes, and congratulations, uh, by the way, Thank on, you very on much. the award. It's, that. it's something. Uh, you work at ASU. Talk to us about what you do at ASU and talk to us again uh, why you won the award and, and, and why what you do is so important. So my role at uh, Arizona State University is Assistant Vice President of Tribal Relations. Uh, I work out of the President's office. The university has had a special advisor to the President of American Indian Initiatives for a number of years. Originally Peterson Zoff, former president at Navajo, Diane Hamitua, who went on to become a, a federal district court judge here in Arizona. And then uh, when I came on board, we split that into two jobs. So Dr. Bray Boy is the special advisor, and my role as the uh, assistant vice president is really internal capacity, MOUs and IGAs, and creating partnerships and enhancing partnerships between Arizona State University and tribal nations and communities. And I would imagine recruitment, a very big factor there. Correct. Uh, recruitment, retention, graduation. Uh, capacity building and you know we have multiple programs at ASU that have been around for a long time Center for Indian Education construction in Indian country Indian legal program all very important programs and, and with 22 tribes in Arizona I think important role for Arizona State to play and more programs more professors more faculty right yes That's part of it as well yes an increase in faculty um, increase in students we've had kind of a, a significant increase year after year of about five to seven percent we're up to about 2,700 American Indian students representing over 200 tribes uh, that are attending Arizona State. So. Kind of easy to figure out why one Man of the Year award, isn't it? Exactly. <laughs> when you go, how, how does this talk about the awards process? Are, are there are there do people nominate others? Do you, do you just know people in the community? How does it work? That's a really good question. So there is an open nomination process, begins in February of each year and closes in May. You can find that uh, nomination form on the Phoenix Indian Center website. We then put together a selection committee of about four to six individuals who actually are past awardees, come and look at the uh, nominations, they rate them, and they actually select the next year's awardees. Wow, so okay, so this is, so it's relatively, once the award night comes, you're pretty much set to go, aren't you? Yes, we are. We now, have some wonderful awardees. And we, I, I was gonna say, we know Jacob here as Man of the Year. The Lifetime Achievement Award went to Urban Gift. Yes, it did. Talk to us about Urban Gift. Well, Urban's from the Gila River Indian community, and he's very well known within the state. Um, he retired from the Gila River Indian community as general manager, also is a veteran um, and participates in many veterans groups, actually the Ira Hayes Post, um, and has been very active on several boards and communities and really helping bring 
awareness to American Indians in different areas. His real focus is really supporting and helping businesses survive. Another Lifetime Achievement Award uh, to Dr. Alberta Arviso. Uh, who is she? Dr. Alberta Arviso is from the University of Arizona, and she's been very significant in really helping create and write new curriculums, primarily with a Navajo focus, much like what Jacob's been working on, to really help recruit and retain students at U of A through graduation. Um, and come to find out, she actually used to work at the Phoenix Indian Center for Phyllis Big Pond. Interesting. Uh, awards like these, honors like these, I mean, obviously they're, they're, they're personal gratification and, and it's, it's a nice thing to get. Sure. But in terms of the community as a whole, how important is, is an event like this? You know, I, I think it, um, as, as Patty said, it, it, it's an opportunity to recognize that don't often get recognized. I think people like myself that do the work aren't necessarily looking for recognition. You know, there's some tremendous need out there in terms of our, our native people, you know, whether they're on reservation or off reservation. We have a significant population in the Phoenix area um, that have been here, you know, uh, really they come back and forth between reservation communities in the Phoenix area. Phoenix Indian Center has really been critical in terms of helping support those that come into the Phoenix area looking for work, looking for opportunities. And so, um, you know, I shared that uh, I was on the Phoenix Indian Center's board in 1978 when I was 18 years old and was really encouraged to get actively involved. And I think, uh, you know, we have a strong community where we come from reservations. I grew up in the Thanatham Nation, but we're looking for a community here in the Phoenix area. So it's a great support system and a great opportunity to recognize uh, those that are doing the work out there. And I would imagine a great opportunity to network as well. And that it is. There's uh, over 150,000 American Indians actually living off reservation within Maricopa County. So we have the opportunity to be providing services for many of them. And then many of our supporters who actually come to the event certainly are our business and our partners here within the valley. So that networking is, is really key for individuals. It's also a place for us to kind of have the opportunity to, you know, it's, it's old home for us. Yes. Because we're seeing people we haven't seen for a long time. Well, it sounds like quite an event. Congratulations on that. And congratulations, Thank Mr. Man of the Year over there. I appreciate that. Thank you both for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Former Secretary of Housing and Urban Development Henry Cisneros was in town this week to give a speech on the importance of immigrants. During his visit, Cisneros appeared on Horizonte and spoke with host Jose Cardenas about immigration and other issues. Here's a portion of that interview. You were here uh, at ASU giving a lecture that, that was entitled, Immigrants and Essential Ingredient for a Strong America in Our Nation's Future. I assume you chose that title before the election. I did, but I would choose it again after the election. Did because you change I really what you said? No, uh, no, I still, I, I believe the core of an immigration reform strategy, which is border security, legalization of the undocumented with appropriate penalties and so forth, and thirdly, a path to citizenship is still the right formulation and we need to stand by it. I don't know whether the new administration is gonna carry out the things they talked about in the campaign, building a wall, repealing the president's executive orders on things like deferred action, uh, the, the banning people on the basis of religion, uh, deporting 12 million people. I don't think they're gonna be able to do that. And so at some moment, credible, middle ground, workable strategies need to be offered. And I have a sense that controlling the presidency, the House, and the Senate, that 
some wise people may say this is our chance to pass something and gain the everlasting appreciation well, there has of been immigrants. Some speculation that it, it, kind of like Nixon being able to go to China Correct. when a Democrat couldn't, and maybe Correct. Trump can can get uh, meaningful immigration reform. But uh, just this week, Chris Kobach uh, from Kansas. Um, has been heard as coming on everything you just mentioned except for the deportation of 12 million people, but yeah. suggesting that DACA will be repealed, that there will well, be a wall be a and everything else. That would be a tragedy. First of all, Trump himself is walking some of this back. On the wall, he's saying, well, part of it can be virtual. It doesn't need to really be a wall. And the truth of the matter is, smart people like Mike Chertoff, former Homeland uh, Secretary, say the real key to border enforcement is not actually at the border. It's the entry exit strategy because we don't have a good way of doing biometrics on people to know when they're overstaying their visas, for example. That's one way to reduce the number of undocumented in the country is deal with them when their visas run out. They, they don't come across the border. They come here legally as students or workers and they overstay their visas. So there's that and uh, at the workplace. Uh, employer uh, sanctions at the workplace that are more effective than border. So I think they may say, look, this is what we wanted to accomplish. We don't think it's going to be done as a wall, for example. Uh, and then there are other pieces of this. DACA, that would be a tragedy. It to take be. young children who came over as babies, right? Uh, no say in the decision, lived here their entire life, many of them top students in high school, doing well in college, and to say, we're going to put you back in a country where you have no network, no connections, just send you back. That, it, it's, it's inhuman. Though, though, unlike the wall, which presents some logistical problems, even if you really wanted to do it, DACA would be fairly easy to end or at least to let expire. Yeah. And then the question is, what, will those students be <sighs> deported? Which I, I suspect he wouldn't do well, that. You know, it's a tragedy uh, if that were to play out uh, because I, I, among many in communities, encourage students to take advantage of DACA and give the government trust their contact information. So the agencies know exactly who they are and where they are, and they, they believe because they were gonna be able to get this program. And it served very, very well. I personally know of cases, including one young man who's a stellar engineering student, who had a weight of the world lifted off the shoulders the day he became legal under DACA. So I'm hopeful that some kind of compassionate instinct will prevail in the final analysis on something as obvious as DACA and the Dreamers. Well, um, uh, I'd like your thoughts on a comment that was made by Ali Nurani of the National Immigration Forum. And he was man. commenting that the day after the election, you know him. Um, and, and he said it was uh, really a vote in many respects on, on culture and a fear and anxiety among people that their country was being taken away and a hope that Trump would take it back. Is, is that your sense of what happened? I think it actually goes one level beyond that. It's not so much about culture as it is about jobs and economics. People are in regions of the country where they're hurting because the economy has changed, manufacturing has left, and they're blaming, yes, trade agreements and, 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 and uh, policies, uh, places where mines have closed because um, it, it, coal doesn't make sense in some, in, in some econ in parts of the economy, etc. And, and, and they're looking for someone to blame. And um, it, it takes the form of identifying the other, someone else that's coming to take jobs and so forth. But there really is no connection there. I really think it's mostly driven by the fear of change, but it's not ethnic or a demographic change so much as it is change economically. Because if you look at the Obama vote, some of the same people who voted for Obama voted for Trump. What has changed is their personal economics, not the fact that they could vote for a minority in 2008 and 2012. So it's not that they're afraid of that kind of change, although there is some of that. There's some racism and there's some outright uh, you know, cultural uh, rejection. But, but I really think it's about the economics. You can watch that entire interview at 1130 tonight on Horizonte here on Arizona PBS. Friday on Arizona Horizon is the Journalist's Roundtable. Speculation continues regarding Arizona officials joining the Trump administration and another controversy involving State Department of Economic Security Director Tim Jeffries. That and more on the next Journalist's Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening.
Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you.